I invite you to hear the reading of the Holy Gospel appointed for the commemoration of St. Mary Magdalene, taken from the 20th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning at the 11th verse. Mary stood without at the sepulchre, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Mary Magdalene told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had said these things unto her. Did you ever play that old telephone game? when you were kids. You know, the game where one person whispers a brief message to the next person, who whispers it to the person next to them, who whispers it to the person next to them, and so on, and so on, and so on. And of course, as you may remember, the challenge comes from trying to hear exactly and repeat exactly the very same message. So challenging, in fact, that sometimes the message at the end of the process, after it's gone through 20 or 30 people, bears no relation at all to the message at the beginning. That kind of game that we may have played as kids is a real-life problem that I see all the time, sometimes harmlessly, sometimes not. It happens in everyday conversations, often, I'm afraid, whenever we give ourselves over to a little gossip. I suspect that we've all seen it happen at one time or another. Did you hear about so-and-so, someone might say to us? who then goes on to tell us about, say, an x-ray that a friend is going to have because they twisted their ankle, and something doesn't feel quite right. A perfectly harmless, perfectly normal kind of conversation with the very best of intentions at heart, with genuine concern for someone that we care about. But then we pick up that story and tell another friend. And when they do the same, perhaps they're not exactly clear about the details. So when they tell the story to someone else, a test that a friend is going to have becomes a test that they've already had. And then as the story develops, and then the story develops as it travels. Suddenly, the test results have come back, and apparently they're not good. Then someone adds the opinion that their friend might, might need surgery. Then the time frame gets shortened as the story develops, and suddenly our friend has already had that imagined surgery. Then someone wonders about further treatment, and that gets added to the story. And someone wonders if the treatment will do any good, because their aunt so-and-so had that, and it didn't go so well. So someone else imagines that nothing can be done, and that gets added to the story. And before you know it, someone is fainting at the grocery store, because they ran into the friend whose funeral they heard had been held last week. All because someone twisted their ankle. As I say, most time that happens is genuinely harmless, but sometimes other things get passed along and added to someone else's story. And sometimes those things that get added to someone else's story are harsh and judgmental, the kind of things that can shape our reputation for the rest of our lives, the kind of things that can scar our soul. Maybe that happened to us in school, or maybe we remember the child, the one who had to carry all that reputation and that judgment, who had to carry all that baggage undeserved. That kind of thing comes to mind whenever I think of Mary Magdalene, because over the years, she picked up a lot of baggage along the way. All of it, I think, quite undeserved. And it goes something like this. 
As you may recall, there's a story in Matthew's Gospel about an unnamed woman anointing Jesus' head with very expensive ointment. And John in his Gospel tells us the same story, this time telling us that the woman's name was Mary and that she used the expensive ointment to anoint his feet and dried his feet with her hair. But there's another story in Luke's Gospel about a different woman, a woman who barges into a dinner party and stands behind Jesus weeping, washing his feet with her tears and wiping them with her hair, a woman who is described as a great sinner and who weeps in sorrow for her sin. And because these stories are just a little bit alike, over the years some have connected the story of a woman named Mary anointing Jesus' feet and wiping them with her hair with the story of the sinful woman washing Jesus' feet with her tears and wiping them with her hair, even though the stories take place at different times in Jesus' life and in different places. And then they've assumed, over the years, that because the woman in one of those stories is called Mary, that someone like Mary Magdalene, whom Luke tells us traveled with Jesus and helped to support him and his followers, could only have made her money, the money she might have needed, for example, to support Jesus and his followers, in a sinful kind of way. And with all of that put together, Mary Magdalene has long been cast as the sinful woman, the great sinner, even the prostitute. A lot of baggage added quite unfairly. And the truth is, Mary didn't need any of that baggage. She already had a reputation and a name, one that she was given by the early church. Apostle to the apostles. That's what they called her. Apostle to the apostles. Because of what John tells us in the gospel, because of what John tells us in the gospel appointed for the commemoration of St. Mary Magdalene. The first witness to the incredible news of Jesus' resurrection. The first to see and believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. The one given the job by the risen Christ himself to go and tell the others, to go and tell the apostles and the disciples, to tell them the scarcely believable news that Jesus was no longer dead, that not even something as powerful and forever as death was any match for the power of God. Apostle to the apostles. Now, I don't know what your baggage might be. I don't know the baggage that you may be forced to carry. Those things from your past that come uninvited and unwanted. I don't know what labels you were given, what names you were called. But I do know this, that in Jesus Christ, the past, whether deserved or undeserved, is the past. We need not be prisoners of what we've done, and we need not be prisoners of what others have done to us or said of us. That harsh words of judgment are no match for the compassionate word of God, risen from the dead. That's what Mary Magdalene witnessed to as the apostle to the apostles. That Jesus is risen from the dead. That death itself is defeated. That death was not his last word and is no longer our last word. And the only thing that's going to forever stay dead for us is the past. Let us pray. O Almighty God, whose blessed Son did sanctify Mary Magdalene and call her to be a witness to his resurrection, mercifully grant that by thy grace we may be healed of all our infirmities and always serve thee in the power of his endless life who with thee and the Holy Spirit liveth and reigneth one God, world without end. Amen.